Today at World Talks, we will be joined by Diana Buttu, a Canadian-Palestinian human rights lawyer and a frequent commentator on Middle East politics. We will be discussing if there is a possibility for a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians, the significance of the Great March of Return in Gaza and the discourse of the politics of hardliners in Israel. Diana Buttu. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Is the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict dead? Absolutely, Ali. It died a, a very long time ago when Israel decided that it wanted to build and expand settlements and when the world decided that it wasn't going to stop Israel. You know, we've been talking about the two-state solution now for 51 years, but for 51 years, all that Palestinians have seen is more and more land, more and more of their land being confiscated, more and more of their land being confiscated to build Israeli-only settlements, and more importantly, with nobody in the world doing anything to stop it. You see, you're ta talking about the settlements, we'll get to that, but also the status of Jerusalem. Recently, the U.S. moved its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. What kind of an impact has that had on the discourse? The impact, Ali, has been so detrimental on two levels. The first is that this isn't just a question of Palestine. The fact that the United States moved their embassy to Jerusalem indicates that they intend to violate international law. There's a reason that no countries around the world have ever recognized uh, it, Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and it's because it was taken by force. And there's a fundamental, very basic element in international law that says that you can't take, any, take over any territory by force. By recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, what the United States has done is they've said, might is right. It's okay for Israel to steal land, and rather than punish Israel, we're going to reward it. What about the role of the Arab states? Have they been complicit? Absolutely. And it's not just the Arab states, it's all of the states around the world. The Arab states have, have sat by idly, doing nothing. You're talking about Egypt, Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and other countries as well who've sat by idly and done nothing. Now, it's questionable whether they have the tools and they have the power to do it, but they certainly have done very, very little, in fact, nothing to support Palestinians. This isn't to say the Arab people. Arab people and people around the world very much support Palestine and very much support our right to freedom, our right to be able to live without Israel uh, sitting on top of us. But sadly, the Arab states have done nothing, and Europe has also done nothing, and Canada. We've talked about the U.S., we've talk, talked about the Arab countries. What about the Palestinians themselves? What about Mahmoud Abbas? He's been in power as head, as president of the Palestinian Authority, for some time. Is he to blame as well? Absolutely. And, but I want to make clear how he is to blame. This isn't an occupation that he can control. One of the big problems with Mahmoud Abbas is that he's lacking strategy, lacking vision. Instead of pushing for Israel to be held accountable, instead of supporting the growing boycott, divestment and sanctions campaign, Mahmoud Abbas for a quarter of a century has simply called for negotiations and more negotiations. He's done nothing to make sure that Palestinians are united. He's tried to separate the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Why is that? What's in it for him to main maintain the status quo, so, so to speak? Power corrupts and the fact that he is... A so he's a corrupt leader who wants to cling on to power. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not embarrassed to say it, even though it probably will cost me. What role does Hamas have to play in all of this? I liken both Hamas and Fatah, the conflict between the two of them, as two bald men who are fighting over a comb. Because at the end of the day, that's what this is about. Look, Hamas had options in the past, and it has options right now. It could have, it could have step as, stepped aside a long time ago and said that this isn't the, the path that they want to move down, that they're much more focused on resistance and more focused on a strategy than on ruling uh, the besieged Gaza Strip. Nobody can make the Gaza Strip work. Not Hamas, not Fatah, nobody. So what is the way forward then? The way forward is for them to unite rather than to, to divide. The Great Return March is also a, a great way of, uh, for Palestinians to unite, to say this is all about our freedom. Tell us a little bit about the basic law recently passed by the Israeli Knesset. How does that change discourse within Israel? 
we're seeing uh, the left, so to speak, which has been against the occupation, recede by and large. Israel is a society that is moving more and more and more to the right. And if you look at the Israeli Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, you've got about 100 out of 120 members of parliament who don't believe in any form of rights for Palestinians. Now, you asked about the nation state law. I actually don't call it the nation state law. I call it the Jewish supremacy law because that's what it is about. It's a law that enshrines that Jewish supremacy will reign in the land. It gives preferential treatment to, uh, to Israeli Jews. It makes sure that in this discussion of whether Israel is a democracy or a Jewish state, that Israel will be declared a Jewish state. And what that means is that people like me, who are citizens of the state, get relegated to second and third class citizenship because what they want to do is put Jewish rights first. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Adi.